Well, good morning, everybody. Sorry being a little bit uh, late this morning. Just uh, got a few things that were a little behind, but glad that you see you that you are here on this frozen day in December of 2021. So next couple days, going to be really, really chilly. Um, I know that you've seen that, that I have this little man-made lake behind me. Uh, it's completely frozen. Kids are starting to ice skate. Well, not really because it's too cold you know, for them to be out very long. Uh, we are in the book of 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 15, you know, as we continue to go through uh, this book verse by verse, chapter by chapter. And so if you just join me, we're going to go through this entire chapter today. It says this, one day Samuel said to Saul, it was the Lord um, who told me to anoint you king of his people, you know, um, Israel. Now listen to his message from the Lord. This is what the Lord of heaven's armies has declared. I have decided to settle accounts with the nation of uh, uh, Amalek for opposing Israel when they came to Egypt. Now go and completely destroy the entire um, uh, uh, Amalekite army, men, women, children, babies, cattle, sheep, goats, camels, and donkeys. Okay, so here's a couple things, you know, that always, you know, bothers us when it comes to the Old Testament. You know, one is that when we see that, to, you know, God seems to be more of a God of judgment or wrath, you know, instead, you know, of the love and joy and peace. He's both, you know, when it comes to all those things. In fact, he's very slow, very, very slow in bringing his justice and judgment. I don't know if you uh, realize this, but it was hundreds of years earlier that the Lord said he would bring this kind of judgment to uh, uh, the, the, the uh, Amalekites. You know, um, the Lord said to Moses back in Deuteronomy chapter 25 and Exodus chapter 17, verses 14 to 16. He says, write this for a memorial in the book of, re of the recount in the hearing of, the, of Joshua, that I will utterly blot out the remembrance of the uh, uh, Amalek from under heaven. And Moses built an altar and called its name, the Lord is my banner. For he said, because the Lord has sworn that the Lord has, has done this, that he will have this from generation to generation. Now, why? Why would he do that? Well, it's because the Amalekites committed a terrible sin against Israel. When the nation was weak and vulnerable, the Amalekites attacked and weakened and the most vulnerable of the nation go to Deuteronomy chapter 25, verse 18. They did this for no reason except violence and greed. And so they, they, they caused this great destruction in the nation of Israel. And God says, okay, there's going to be a day and a time you know, when this is going to happen. Now, he's always willing to allow people to repent, always willing for people to turn their hearts and their minds back to him. He is slow. He is patient. It's been 400 years since he made this declaration, you know, hoping you know, that this would take place. You know, then the second question always becomes, okay, so now that we've seen this, then why the babies? You know, why the little children? You know, why all that kind of stuff? Well, first answer, I don't fully know. We won't fully know 100%, you know, on this side of eternity, but we do know that God's thoughts and ways are greater than our thoughts and ways. The other reason I'm about to give you in just a second, okay? So hold that question because I know that's always one that comes up. You know, so hold the question on the why the children, why all that kind of stuff. So verse four, so Saul mobilized his army, you know, at Telem, there were 2,000, 200,000 soldiers from Israel and 10,000 men from Judah. Then Saul and his army went to the town of the Amalekites and lay in wait in the valley. Saul sent this warning to Kenites, move away from where the Amalekites live or you will die with them for, for you showed kindness to all the people of Israel when they came up from Egypt. So the Kenites packed up and left. So that was nice, you know, to be able to remember all of that, that that had taken place. Verse seven, then Saul slaughtered the Amalekites from Havilah all the way to Shur, east of Egypt. He captured Agog, the Amalekite king, but completely, he captured the king, but completely destroyed everything else. Saul and his men spared Agag's life and kept the best of the sheep and the goats, the cattle, the fat calves, the lambs, everything, in fact, that appealed to them. They destroyed only what was worthless or of poor quality. So one of the things in, in, in this ancient time of war is sometimes the way that you would pay the army is to say, you can keep what you plunder. And God was saying, no, I don't want you to keep any of those things. And they're 100% disobeying what's taken place. Then the Lord said to Samuel, I am sorry that I ever made Saul king 
for he has not been loyal to me and has refused to obey my command. Now, it's not that God didn't know. Remember, it was a few chapters earlier that he said that one day God would raise up a man after his own heart and that guy would be David, which we're gonna be introduced to in just a little few more days. Uh, Samuel was so deeply moved when he heard this, they cried out to the Lord all night. It doesn't mean that even though that this happens, that God's heart does not hurt, that God weeps with those who weeps. You know, it's not that he didn't know, he's just sorry. He just like, he just sees the pain in which he knew would take place going back to Israel when they rejected him as king and they wanted their own king. He knew all this was gonna happen and yet it doesn't lessen the fact that our God has emotion, that our God has pain. Remember, we are created in the image of God, in his likeness. So there's the same kind of emotion, you know, it goes through God except without sin. And so just know that our God has these kinds of emotions you know, in his heart and in his mind as well. Verse 12, early the next morning, Samuel went to find Saul. Someone told him, Saul went to the town of Carmel to set up a monument to himself, not to God. He set up a monument to himself and then he went on to Gilgal. When Samuel finally found him, Saul greeted him cheerfully. May the Lord bless you, he said. I have carried out the Lord's command. Then what is all the bleeding of the sheep and goats and the lowing of the cattle I hear, Saul, Samuel demanded. It's true that the army spared the best of the sheep, the goats, and the cattle, Saul admitted, but they're going to sacrifice them to the Lord your God. We have destroyed everything else. Then Samuel said to Saul, stop, listen to what the Lord told me last night. What did he tell you? Saul asked. And Samuel told him, although you may think little of yourself, you are not the leader of the tribes of Israel. In other words, you don't think of yourself highly. You care much more about what other people think of you than what God thinks of you is what he's saying. The Lord has anointed you king of Israel and the Lord sent you on a mission and told you, go and completely destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, until they're all dead. Why haven't you obeyed the Lord? Why did you rush for the plunder and do what was evil in the Lord's sight? But I did obey the Lord, Saul insisted. I carried out the mission he gave me. I brought back King Agag, but I destroyed everyone else. Then my troops brought in the best of the sheep, goats, cattle, plunder to sacrifice to the Lord, your God at Gilgal once again. Saul misses the whole point. It's not about, you know, the things that he thinks are important. It's about him being obedient to God. And then he says to the Lord, your God, not the Lord, my God. Once again, he doesn't have God in his heart as preeminence in first place. But Samuel replied, what is more pleasing to the Lord, your burnt offerings and sacrifices or your obedience to his voice? What a great great way to stop for a second right now. What is more pleasing to the Lord? Your attendance at church, the tithes and the gifts that you give, or is it our obedience to him? Parents, what is more pleasing to you? The obedience of your child or some of the sacrifices and the different things that they do? It's always going to be obedience that you're going to want to see as it pertains to your relationship. Listen, Obedience, it says, is better than sacrifice and submission is better than offering the fat of the rams. Rebellion is as sinful as witchcraft and stubbornness is bad as worshiping idols. So because you've rejected the command of the Lord, he has rejected you as king. So before we go any further, I wanna go back and say, why in the world again would God say, why the kids, why the babies, why all that kind of stuff? Okay, my first one I told you is I won't fully know until we get to the other side of eternity. There's all of these reasons and things why, but you're gonna have to trust that God's ways and thoughts are greater than eyes. Now, the reason, secondly, that we know this to be true is that because the rest were not utterly destroyed, the rest came back to haunt the nation of Israel. They had already abused and tortured. The Amalekites were some of the worst of the worst. You need to understand, you know, this is before the spirit, sin reigned in and through their bodies. Human sacrifice, you know, um, was, was common among these people. You know, they murdered and killed and raped and pillaged and did things upon things upon things upon things. And God was slow, very, very slow, 400 years, remember, 400 years in bringing any kind of judgment, you know, against this people, hoping that one day that they would return. So he was slow. But then it says, you know, as we read on, there were still, because Saul did not do what was asked, 
all the kids, the babies, all that kind of stuff that we talked about, is that there were still Amalekites left alive. David had to deal with them out the Amalekites. And we're going to read about that, you know, in chapters 27, verse 30, and in 2 Samuel. Haman, okay? Haman, the evil man who tried to wipe out all the Jewish people in the days of Esther, was a descendant from the tribe of the Amalekites, Agog. He was one of the descendants who was part of that tribe who tried to wipe out all the nation of Israel. And most ironic of all, Saul was actually killed on the field of battle by an Amalekite who claimed to deliver the final thrust of the sword in 2 Samuel chapter 1, verses 8 through 10. When we don't obey God completely, the leftover portion will surely come back to trouble us, if not kill us. So God, we don't understand all the reasons why. We just know, once again, that there are some things that we're going to have to trust in him, and it's not the way that he normally responds, and it's not something he responds quickly or out of vengeance or wrath in an immediacy. He tries many, many, many times. If you don't believe me, you need to go back and understand the case behind Jonah and the whale, and go back behind that, and why God really wants people to repent. And again, if I had more time, I'd walk through the whole, you know, uh, evil of the Amalekites and the destruction that should have taken place, et cetera, et cetera. And so hope that answers a little bit. I know that there's some things that won't be fully settled until we reach, until our place in heaven. So let's go back to our passage. Then Saul admitted to Samuel, verse 24, yes, I have sinned. I've disobeyed your instructions and the Lord's command for, and notice this, for I was afraid of the people and did what they demanded. This is the second or third time that we read that Saul cares more about what people think than what God thinks. I wonder if that could be true of us as well. But now, please forgive my sin and come back with me so that I may worship the Lord. But Samuel replied, I will not go back with you. Since you've rejected the Lord's command, he has rejected you as the king of Israel. He's not rejected him, just him as king of Israel. As Samuel turned to go, Saul tried to hold him back and tore the hem of his robe. And Samuel said to him, the Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you today and has given it to someone else, one who is better than you. And he who is in the glory of Israel will not lie, nor will he change his mind, for he is not human and that he should change his mind. Then Saul pleaded again, I know I've sinned, but please at least honor me before the elders of my people before Israel by coming back with me so that I may worship the Lord. Notice again, but honor me before the elders and my people. He still cares more about what people think. But so finally, finally, Samuel finally agreed and went back with him and Saul worshiped the Lord. But his purpose again was in front of people. Verse 32, then Samuel said, bring King Agag to me. Agag arrived full of hope for he thought, surely the worst is over and I have been spared. But Samuel said, as the sword, as your sword has killed the sons of many mothers, now your mother will be childless. And Samuel cut Agag to pieces before the Lord at Gilgal. This guy, this king was brutal, by the way, just brutal. Then Samuel went home to Ramah and Saul returned to his house in Gibeath of Saul. Samuel never went to meet with Saul again, but he mourned constantly for him. And the Lord was sorry he had ever made Saul king of Israel. So with this, you know, one of the things that maybe we'll take some time and really walk through some of the, I don't understand what God does in the Old Testament on one of these days. But as we pause for this point, here's what I want to ask is our obedience to God is more important than the things that we do for God. Are we following him in word and deed? Second thing is, are we caring more about what he thinks and what he says than what we think and what other people say? How often, you know, that it is so easy because we love our kids and we love our family and we love our friends and we love our country and we love all these things that it's so easy for us to do more of what we think is right in our own eyes or what other people think. So we enter a time and we enter a season in our nation, you know, where all of a sudden, because of our love for people, we start saying, well, that must not be too bad or, you know, that must not even be a sin at all. And so we like to redirect God's words and his word because of the way we feel and we must feel a certain way and we want to be guided by how we feel internally, whether it be our identity, our sexuality, our, our uh, pride, you know, our materialism or whatever it may be. All of us have these issues, you know, that we believe, you know, are the ones that are right and we believe we're right in our own eyes or in the eyes of others. And what we need to do is continue to say, God, we want to be right in your eyes. And we want to not be afraid of what other people say or do, 
but we want to be obedient to you. That's my heart. That's my prayer for you on this day as we continue to serve and follow him. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you so much. This is your day. Uh, We just want to serve you. Uh, Lord, there are things that we don't fully understand in your word, and we just ask for your wisdom and guidance and trying to understand, you know, what that looks like and why you would do some of the things that you do, and yet we don't see things from your perspective. We don't know all things, and yet, Father, we love you, and we just trust you and entrust ourselves to you. Help us to be obedient to you on this day. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey guys, have a wonderful rest of the day. I want to remind you, tomorrow night, back at services, back at church, you know, uh, online, on site, you know, as we kick off this new series, Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. Stay indoors. Enjoy the do- enjoy the day. I know that I'm going to be taking Angelie to a movie, you know, and uh, maybe some of you guys, I'll see you there, you know, because I know there's going to be a lot of indoor activity uh, these next few days. Love you guys.